everyone, and welcome to The Thriving Relationship Show. I am your host, Christine Earthheart, founder of The Center for Thriving Relationships, and I am so grateful and excited to have you here and to get to support you in experiencing more love, connection, and understanding in your relationship. And today's incredibly special guest has influenced my own relationship and the work that we do here at The Center as much as anyone. She's really a hero and a legend among our team here and all over the world. She is required reading for all of the students in our Thriving Relationship Coach Certification Program. She is the most recommended resource to all of our clients here. She is highly esteemed and endorsed by the pioneering researcher, Dr. John Gottman. She will truly be written about for decades to come in psychology textbooks, and she really is the one that we have to credit for popularizing and helping us understand how attachment is applied to romantic relationships. She has really revolutionized the field of marriage counseling and how we understand the science of love. Dr. Sue Johnson, who is a researcher, clinical psychologist, and developer of emotionally focused therapy, a tested, proven, and evidence-based intervention for couples. She has received many awards for her research and was named Psychologist of the Year by the American Psychological Association. She is the best-selling author of Hold Me Tight and Love Sense, the revolutionary new science of romantic relationships, and so much more. Welcome, Dr. Sue. Such an honor and absolute delight to have you here. My goodness, that was quite an intro. Okay, okay, very lovely. Okay, <laughs> you, you could just keep saying that. That makes me feel good, jolly good. Yeah, all right. I mean, every word. Thank you so much for your extraordinary contribution. I just feel like anybody who is kind of tapped into the world of relationships, we just really see them entirely differently because of your research and your commitment to diving in and seeing like, huh, how we're approaching relationships. Maybe we're missing something. So I'm curious if we can start up there. You got into this work and because you were kind of debunking some myths, like what are the what are the things that you saw that weren't totally working when it came to people trying to mend and repair their relationships and grow and strengthen them? Oh, well, you know, um, I was a on fire graduate student, but actually I thought I was pretty hot. You know, I thought I could, I could probably, you know, do anything. I, I'd done all kinds of groups and families and individuals. And, and then I got given I went to a, a clinic where I was asked to work with these distressed couples. And to my horror, uh, I felt like I was completely ineffective. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then I realized no one knew what was going on here. I went to the library and there were analytic books on collusion and ideas about that, you know, about how we, we take things from our child and we put them on our partner. That wasn't very convincing. Then I, I went to the library again and it talked about how, oh, people don't have the communication skills, so just teach them. Well, what I noticed with the couples I was working with was they were very skilled when they weren't talking to their partner. And, uh, and also when they were talking to their partner, they couldn't use the skills at all because they would just get so emotionally upset. So I thought, well, this isn't going to work. And then I thought, well, who understands? Oh, wait a minute. These people aren't having fights. They look like they're having fights about washing up or who does the chores or, but they're not. It, you know, from my own training, they're having fights about, you know, whether they feel loved, whether they feel seen, whether they feel important. That's what they're having fights about. So then I got into the whole thing of, well, this is a mess then because nobody understands romantic love and nobody, you know, like, oh, you know, love. Everyone has, knows for years that love's a mystery. There's nothing you can know about that. And so I was caught mostly because it was um, such a mystery and also in my own childhood, I mean, my parents' distressed marriage, they loved each other. I always knew that. But my parents' distressed marriage was a huge, 
huge part of my childhood, okay? And uh, so, you know, it had some relevance for me. So I just got caught and I started watching tapes, obsessively watching tapes of my couples, watching them again and again and again. And I started to see patterns. And I started to see that certain responses helped and certain ones didn't, you know. And so I started to kind of work that up and kind of try to generate these positive responses. I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I was so caught by it that I I decided to do my doctoral thesis on it, which when I think of it was insanity, okay? It was just insanity. And um, and everyone agreed it was insanity. All the professors at the university agreed it was, it was much too huge, okay? But I did it because I was nuts. I did it because I was on fire. And the interventions worked. In fact, I ran the data three times because I thought, no, there's no way there's no way that this date that this can be so useful. And I compared it to a skill training uh, intervention, okay? And I thought, this is impossible. It can't be this effective. But it was. So I sent it out and I got an article and I got a professorship on the basis of that. But I still didn't really know what I was doing. And then a few months later, um, somebody said to me, in a social situation, well, you know, I mean, really, we don't understand love, do we? And, uh, well, if love isn't bargains that people can get skills for and bargain for, what is it, right? And I heard myself say, don't be silly. It's an emotional bond. And the whole of John Bowlby's amazing attachment science, which has grown massively since then and applied to adults and has huge thousands of studies on it, right? It's um, it's it's John Bowlby's attachment theory is the best um, personal, developmental personality theory we have, but it's relational. It puts us in a relational context. It says we're bonding social human beings and if we don't understand that, we don't understand anything. We take people out of context. Of course, their behavior looks weird. Of course it does. If you take a fish out of water, it looks weird, right? But our water that we live in is relationships. So I started to remember all John Bowlby's work. And I started to try and write about it. Well, that was a lesson in frustration. Uh, like no, nobody, nobody wanted to hear some strange Canadian psychology professor rabbit on about bonds and, and you know, everyone knew that adults were supposed to be differentiated, individuated, self-sufficient, you know, and I thought, I don't think so. No, no I'm English working class, right? English working class culture, you know that you depend on other people. That is clear as day from the day you are born. And English working class culture is very much about coming together and supporting each other, right? Um, so I knew that was wrong, but um, it was very difficult. Nobody really wanted to hear me. Um, you know, people, professors would stand up and say things like, we don't understand emotion. And I... <laughs> I've always been a bit um, oppositional, okay. So um, so I would say, excuse me, but I think we do. This is what emotion is all about. This is what um, this is why it's so important and this is why we should focus on it in therapy. Well, that would go down like, you know, uh, like go away. You know? And then when I started writing these articles on adult attachment, oh, um, I get huge pages and pages of nasty, nasty, nasty reviews, basically saying I was out to lunch. And so I just wanted to let you all know, 
Dr. Sue, her internet connection was a little rocky for just a little bit here. So if you get through the next segment, I assure you it gets so much smoother from here and you won't want to miss anything she shares. Thank you so much for being here. Enjoy. If you persist and you know you've got, you know that you're, you know, um, you've got something good and you know that it's right because you keep teaching your students and it works and you keep doing it with your couples and you keep doing research studies and it works. So how can it not be? And then I wrote, hold me tight. Yeah. So, so everything changed for me with the, with the publication of hold me tight. Mm. Well, thank because you. For, suddenly for it was the hardest thing I've ever written. Um, you know, I was an good but I sort of managed through it, and um, that book, I think, has had a huge impact mm -hmm. in the world. So, um, and it's still selling. Yeah, it's still selling all over the world. It's just been translated into Ubek, which is the language in Ubekistan. I don't even know where Uzbekistan is, okay? But it's just been translated and it sort of blows my mind the sort of reach it's having, you know? It's really, really incredible. Right. Okay, so from working with okay. clients and you were seeing what works, what doesn't, you were just discovering that it's not just about having the skills. It's not about knowing how to be a great communicator. It's certainly not about us just learning to be take personal responsibility and self-sufficient and also not simply about knowing how our past and our childhood is impacting our relationship. So thank you so much for just diving in and doing the research and being unwilling to simply settle for what was out there, even if you met some resistance initially and people thought you were taking on way too big of a project or that it wasn't fully making sense, that it's really, it's about emotional connection. So for people that are tuning in, that they're not entirely familiar with attachment and the importance of emotional connection, of course, your entire therapeutic technique is all about emotionally focused therapy. Can you tell us a little bit about why is attachment and connection and our bonds and emotional bonds, why are they so fundamental for us to understand and nurture to have healthy, thriving relationships? Yes. The bottom line is what John Bobby, the father of attachment science, said is that Freud was wrong and the most important and the most powerful instincts in man are not aggression and sex, sexuality. They are the need for connection with another human being. If you think about it, our little are vulnerable and frail for longer than any other uh, little being born into the world. And, uh, and it is true that all, and no one comes, they die. And that is true. And it is like wired into your nervous system. It's not something you can decide about. It's wired into your nervous system, this need to connect with others, to be able to know you, you can call and another will come because you matter to them, because they see you, care about your need, because they care about your pain, right? Um, this is a most basic human reality. Focus on mothers and children. And attachment science first did focus on mothers and children. But then we were... Uh, you know, researchers realized, wait a minute, this isn't just mothers and children. It goes from the cradle to the grave. We was a safe haven that we can go to when we need and a secure base. So we all need to have a safe haven, secure base relationship, a place where we can go to for comfort and support and a place that allows us to have a platform to stand in and feel empowered by 
where we can go out into the world. You know, if you know someone's got your back, it's easy for you to run the world and take risks or a 60 year old. And this is a basic reality of human beings, this need for other people. And we internalize this reality. Like, um, I don't know about you, but most of us have someone in our life that was key to us. And I invite you to think about that they're still a source of support. My father was my key attachment figure and I can still hear his voice. I still have an image of his hands. In fact, I think the reason I married my husband is because his hands are just like my father's, okay. But, um, you know, uh, and he would tell me the most amazing things for a working class man talking to a working class girl at that time in history. I don't know where he got his uh, incredible ability to parent from, but he basically told me, you can do anything you want. You're powerful, you're special, you matter to me. You can do anything you want. Uh, you want to go to America? You don't know anybody there? Go for it, sweetie, you'll be fine. And if you're, you're strong enough to deal with anything, and if you're and if you're not, I'll bring you home to me. Now, how he would have done that, I don't know, because we had no money, we were poor, okay? But anyway, you know, the point is, he was this secure figure in my life. And I mean, in my in my world, uh, women, why are you reading that book? You know, you're going to be a wife. You know, you're a working girl. What are you reading that book for? You're going to be a nurse, a hairdresser, and a wife, okay? Just stop it, you know? My father would say, read the book soon. Just read, read that book. You know, he was the one who sort of stayed with me. And so I still have him inside. I mean, we don't let go of those key attachment figures. We carry them with us. And so we do with our um, with the the people we love now, you know. We we when we're scared or upset or off balance, then we we think of the people we love as a source of support, and we know now what creates a secure bond. Love is not a mystery anymore, and we know now. And from thousands of studies, what creates a secure bond is two people of whatever age coming together on an emotional level, not sharing information, okay? Computers can do that. Coming together on an emotional level and being emotionally open with each other, you know, looking into each other's eyes, being, being open to each other and responsive, responsive to the cues and staying engaged with each other. So, you know, when you watch our couples <coughs> move from blaming, which is, you know, um, why don't you talk to me? <coughs> well, because you're so difficult to talk to, right? into I do um, get angry with you. I do criticize you because I'm desperate for your attention. I'm desperate for you to look at me and tell me I matter to you. And the other person goes, what? Oh, that's uh, a new music. That's new emotional music. That's new language what 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 right and it starts to shift everything that music it shifts the dance between the couple <laughs> and the other person says well i do shut you out i do i shut you out not because you don't matter but because you matter so much and i can't bear to hear that i'm disappointing you it scares me i can't bear it it's overwhelming. So I shut down. And of course, tricky part is the more one person shuts down, 
The more upset and angry the other person gets, the more they push and criticize, the more they push and criticize, the more rejected the other person feels, the more they shut down. And that's a dance that consumes an awful lot of relationships in North America and probably all over the world. Um, so, you know, it was about time we figured it out. But it's about time that we looked at, we actually looked at relationships on a video and said, what is happening here? And how can we shift it? And now we do know how to shift it. We know how to help people create secure bonds. And that is not me, um, you know, giving you my opinion or, or uh, stating some sort of proposal to you. That is our research. We've shown it in um, 30 years of studies. We know how to shift. We know how not just to make relationships happier, but how to help people create loving bonds that last. Mm. See, there's so many ideas about love that are just ideas. Love is like infatuation. You know, um, well, in fact, no, it isn't. Infatuation is just the beginning, beginning of love, you know. But love is infatuation and it can't possibly last. Yes, it can. Um, you know, familiarity destroys love. Well, flat, ordinary familiarity, you don't share anything. Yeah, that destroys love. That's boring. But real emotional engagement? Oh, no. Oh, and also, um, you know, you can't have a good sex life if you have a loving relationship. What? I mean, all the research says the opposite. All the research says that people have the best sex um, and the most thrilling sex are people in long-term love, happy love relationships. Of course, if I'm safe with you, that doesn't turn me off sexually. It turns me on. If I'm safe with you, I can play. I can have. I can tell you my what I want, my erotic fantasies and desires. We can play together. We can dance, and every time we dance together, it's different and fascinating. This is healthy sex. And the thing about this is healthy relationships equal healthy people. The people who have secure connection with others are the strongest mentally, emotionally, physically. They're the most resilient. Um, there's so much data on this. You know, we have this image in our society of strength as something like Rambo. Well, Rambo's not, you know, give me a break. I mean, my granny would, and her umbrella would have been able to demolish Rambo. She just smacked him on the head and told him to go home. Okay. Like, um, no, 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 no. Denying your vulnerability and acting out this scenario, that's not strength. We all know that on some level. Strength is knowing who you are having a secure connection with yourself, being able to accept your emotions, knowing you're vulnerable and being able to deal with it and reaching for other people when you need them in a way that pulls them close. That's strength. That's real strength. And um, one thing I love about couples therapy is that when you help people have these bonding, hobby tight conversations, not only does the relationship change, the people change. They become less depressed, less anxious, more confident, more sure of themselves. They feel more worthy. Of course they do, because they can turn to their partner and say, oh, I'm anxious right now. And their partner can say, it's okay. You can do this. I've got your back. I'm with you. Go for it, sweetie. Say, oh, all right. There's a lovely study of young career women by a woman, lady called Brooke, Brooke, Brooke. I think it's Shields, but I could be wrong. She looked at young career women and she found that the career women that had the best 
bonds with their partner, the most secure bonds, which is not just a happy relationship, it's a depth of connection, right? Those women um, were more confident out in their jobs, they took more risks, they got further in their careers, they felt better about themselves, right? Even when, if they failed sometimes, they recovered faster. Yeah, of course. We are not wired to be emotionally alone. And what I just said is hugely significant because sometimes it feels to me like our world um, just ignores what I just said. It just, it, it doesn't, it's not a, our world ignores more and more people live alone. Of course, you can have deep emotional connections and live alone, but more and more people report being lonely, depressed. More and more people live alone. Community connections are being eroded. Hey, what are we doing? We're creating an environment that we can't live in. You know, it's like the fish all deciding to change the water to jelly or something, right? Say, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Well, they they are, okay? So um, there's a lot of talking out there about how loneliness is a huge issue in our society, but we don't actually, I mean, apart from, you know, helping people build relationships, which is great, and if we can do that, that's great, educating people about relationships. In lots of other ways, we don't really seem to be willing to do anything about that. You know, it's not like one of our priorities to, uh, why don't we build housing around a community hub? I, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why um, in some parts of North America, churches are having this huge um, uprising. Yes, they are, because they're sources of community, where people feel seen, important, like they matter. You know, hey, you know, this is, but we don't just need that social connection. We also need um, loving relationships in our families and with our, with our romantic partners. Mm, I I love that, and I I was so excited that you're doing work too. You mentioned before we started recording with cardiologists, really looking at the health benefits. So thank you for highlighting those. Of it is so detrimental to our mental health, our emotional health, our you know physical well being when we don't feel a deep sense of connection. And uh, you mentioned some of the things, so turning towards and having eye contact and sharing the more vulnerable feelings underneath. The perceived conflict. We use an expression, wonder and look under. It's like there's so much underneath. Oh, I like that. That's uh, very good. I like that a lot. Wonder yeah. and look under. That's dynamite. I love it. Wow. Yeah. Thanks so you much. Know, inspired by your incredible research. Yeah. I mean, um, basically, a hold me tight conversation is about sharing your vulnerabilities and your needs. You're calling somebody in to help you with those. And uh, that's what it is, right? So yeah, we've um, we've been doing this research on working with um, couples where one person's had a heart attack. And this is a life-changing event for most people, okay? It brings their human frailty uh, right here, okay? And, um, but you know, the reason that we were asked to go and help the Big Heart Institute in, Canada's capital is because uh, the cardiologists were noticing that people with distressed relationships didn't show up for their appointments. They didn't take their meds. They didn't come to the gym program. What's that about? So, you know, <laughs> the classic one is I, I worked with this couple. I love them. And, um, He'd never had anything wrong with him in his whole life until he had this heart attack, you know, so, right? He's this sort of woodsman, right? And they'd have the sort of fight where she'd say to him, very carefully, she'd say to him, do you think 
you should be having all that wine, dear. And he'd say, oh, right. Just keep reminding me that I'm sick, that I'm a sicko, that I've got a big physical problem, that I'm not the man I was. Right. You know, just monitor me all the time and tell me I'm doing so. Oh, so the whole thing goes to hell. Right. She says you're impossible. And he storms out into the night in the country by himself with no cell phone in his car, in his car, drives around all night without his nitroglycerin. Right. She doesn't know where he is. If something had happened to him, he wouldn't have been able to contact anybody. Comes back the next morning, says he's not going to the doctor's appointment. Right. He's not taking his meds. This is classic. Right. And, and she just doesn't know what to do with him. Right. She just and he's shutting down and enraged. And but when they start to talk on an emotional connected level, and she shares that she's perpetually terrified that he's about to have another uh, cardiac event, right? Perpetually terrified. And that she can't share that with him because she doesn't want to worry him. And when he's able to share that this has been absolutely devastating for him and has somehow knocked the stuffing out of the, the man he thought he was, right? And does she still want a man with a cardiac problem? Well, yes, she does. She does. Which is why she says things like, do you think you should be drinking all that wine? See, but so they come together. And as they come together, he starts taking his meds, going to his appointments, going to the gym. So the cardiologists are fascinated with the um, physical impact of this. Of course they are. I know they'll find, they're, they're, they're doing this huge research project. Um, I know that they'll they'll find physical results. I'm more interested in the what happens when these people create more secure attachment because more secure attachment, we know, just facilitates every single positive um, response that you have in terms of mental and physical health, okay? Um, it, it just does. There's all kinds of research about that. It, if you want a source of resilience, you know, um, the, the best source of resilience in human beings is whether they have an intimate, loving relationship or not. Uh, that was true in 9-11. They looked at the people who um, were in the area of 9-11, and they looked at the people that had at least one relationship where they could go and confide, get comfort. Well, those people, months and months later, were doing fine. The people that weren't doing fine were the people who had no relationships to rely on, who said, I'm fine. I, I don't need to talk to anybody. I don't need any relationships. I'm just going to shut it down. Emotions are very, very, very difficult to shut down. And that's the truth. And it costs you when you shut them down. Your physiology, I, you know, I always say to my clients, it's like pushing something down all the time. And it's going to, it's going to do this, okay? And all that happens is you get more and more sensitive to what you're pushing away. But, you know, avoidance is our human being's favorite way of protecting ourselves. It doesn't really protect us at all, but it usually leads straight back into all the trouble we're in. But, you know, um, that's what we do. Uh, or, you know, freaking out. You're just freaking out and, and getting anxious and going and getting meds from the doctor, right? Well, no, the best and most natural thing to do when you're stressed out of your mind is to turn to the safest person you know in the world and say, I'm scared and I'm stressed out of my mind and I'm overwhelmed and I need you to be here with me. I need you to listen. You know, people don't need other people to solve their problems yeah. so much. Yeah. They need them to 
be there. You know, the, the big question in relationships is, are you there for me? Are you there for me? You know, you and being there for me doesn't mean that you come up with five ways for me to deal with my stress or, you know, um, or the most perfect answer to my problems with my career. And I think people get caught in that. Well, I don't have the, I don't have, I don't have what my partner needs. I don't have the perfect answer. You don't have to have the perfect answer. You just have to be there. Like a mother with a child, you know, the mother has to be there. You know, um, the child can survive being upset. You know, the child can survive seeing the big dog and getting scared as long as the mother is there. And if you listen to the way mothers talk to children, it's the way people naturally talk to each other in hold me tight conversations. The mothers don't talk to children high and fast the way I'm talking to you now, which is about information. Listen to the music. Da 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 right? I'm talking to your prefrontal cortex. Mothers talk to the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain. Mothers go, da 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 If you listen to people when they're bonding, their voices are soft and slow and low. It's kind of like they're talking. They're in this emotional channel and they're talking to their partner's amygdala. They're talking to this emotional connection, right? Which is basic to human beings. It's basic to all kinds of animals. I remember sitting in uh, Amsterdam once for an hour, watching these swans do their mating ritual. All they did, they all was so beautiful. They twine their necks together and then put their necks back on their, their heads back on their backs. Mm -hmm. They twine their necks together. And it was like watching, are you there for me? Are you predictable? You know, will you respond to me? If I move my neck, will you move your neck? Oh, you are there for me. Ah, let's do that again. Are you there for me? Right? I mean, this is, bonding is basic to animals, you know, to all animals, I think. But in human beings, oh, we're vulnerable for so long. We have so much need for connection. Uh, you don't answer that need. There's all kinds of dreadful ramifications from that one. Mm, it's so deeply beautiful how you describe it. Thank you so, so much. So couples that are wanting to move forward and deepening their sense of attachment with each other. Um, yeah. Having these kinds of conversations where you can share emotionally and vulnerably about what's really there. And that when each other shares what I'm hearing you say, it's not about giving advice. It's meeting each other in that, like just being with one another in whatever we're emotion we're feeling. So we don't feel alone. And it's like, I, That's right. I I'm here. Whatever it is, we're totally doing this together um, because I imagine I've certainly seen there are couples who spend a lot of time together. So it isn't just the amount of time we spend, right? It's it's how the kinds of conversations and the way that we're really emotionally connecting. Um, yes. And I think one of the things that Balby said all those years ago, that our society um, had such trouble with and still has trouble with, is the idea that um, a sense of emotional aloneness, not just being alone in the world, right? Some people can live alone and it's fine for them. Um, but a sense of emotional aloneness, not mattering to another human being. Bobby basically said, uh, human beings can't tolerate that. It's, it's not 
they're not wired for it. They can't tolerate it. If you if if you put a human being in that situation, they'll dash out and try and find an escape, an addiction, you know, something to take them out of that space. Um, because emotional isolation, connection with others is our main survival script as human beings. And not having that connection, our human brains know this is dangerous. This is not viable. This is, I cannot deal with this aloneness. And when you work with people who are dealing with trauma, um, one of the key, I mean, I know it in my head, but it always hits me how significant it is that most of these people dealt with trauma in their childhood or even as adults alone, okay? They, you know, in the military, they were told, don't talk to your wife about what happened over there. It was hell. You don't want her in hell. And the wife was told, don't ask him questions. What? You're building in emotional isolation? When this guy's just come back from deployment? Are you insane? <laughs> well, that's what I said to the high up at the Pentagon. They didn't like it much. Okay, like, um, um, you know, but yeah, they were. You know, smile and be, you know, be strong. Smile and be, what? What are you talking about? These guys need to be held. They need to be listened to. They need to know their wife sees them. They need to know that she still cares for the guy that's come back, who isn't the same guy that left, right? And if you take that away, oi, um, the Canadian military and I had a long talk a couple of years ago about the fact that our Canadian soldiers are committing suicide. And they didn't want the soldiers to commit suicide. All right, fair enough. So then I say, but you do know, don't you, that 80% of the soldiers that commit suicide do it in the two weeks after their partners left them. Silence. If you don't want them to commit suicide, help them care for their relationship. Yeah. It's the biggest source of resilience they have. But no, you know, give the guy, you know, meds, endless meds, endless meds. You know, they'd give the guy support groups. Well, support groups are great. They helped. But in the middle of the night, when the demons come for him, who's there? His wife. And if nobody helps her understand what's going on, and nobody helps her be there for him. Most of the time she's freaked out. She doesn't know what's going on. So she isn't emotionally engaged. Once again, he's alone. Right? And being alone turns on every single alarm bell and vigilant bell and... Um, reactive bell in your brain you know it just um but it's something that we haven't believed about ourselves it's something what attachment science basically does is it tells us who we are and we don't always want to know <laughs> we don't always want to know that we need other people and you know no no i don't want to know that you know i'm fine by myself right um but that's what it does. Mm -hmm. And so it gives us, it's it, basically attachment science has cracked the code of love. And I like to feel that us in EFT, in emotionally focused therapy and in our Hold Me Tight programs have taken that cracked code and turned it into a, okay, if this, then that, 
this is how to build a loving relationship. Yes, you can build a loving relationship. Yes, it can last. Yes, you can hurt each other and wound each other and come back and find a way to be together. Yes, you can. Yes, you can have an alive sexual relationship, even though you've been together for 30 years. You can. This is nonsense what we've been told in the media. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, it, sex is all about novelty. You know, you've got to find some new game to play. Well, you know, five minutes after you've started the new game, it's not new anymore. Okay. So, you know, it's, um, and then you're back where you started, which is, um, apparently not being able to communicate right so um you know, our couples who improve their relationship their sex life gets better even if we don't address it at all in therapy yeah because they dance in a more attuned way they dance together you know not in this sort of separate realms you know of I mean, relationships and marriage has changed, let's face it. It used to be an economic thing. You know, when I was 18, my auntie told me, Susan, what are you doing reading all these books? And she said, you have to, it's time for you to find a man to marry. And I said, oh, okay, auntie, what should my criteria be? And she said, um, he should have a suit. <laughs> which means you know, he had some sort of financial right of course yeah he should have a suit so I just roared with laughter which she didn't like very much <laughs> but you know um and I said no I'm not getting married as far as I can see it's a craziness nobody knows how to do it and nobody understands love so why should I get married and I was at 18 already charting my life path it seemed but um, but yeah, marriage has changed from an economic proposal to an emotional proposal. You know, many of us don't actually need to get married, which is wonderful. Women have that freedom now. Um, so it's not about that. What is it about then? Well, it's about having a companion for your life. It's about walking through life with somebody to share with and to grow with and to be there for you and to go on amazing adventures together. You know, it's like uh, I've been married for 36 years. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm, I have the most wonderful husband. That's why. Okay. And um, when I think about it, We've gone on so many adventures in our life that we wouldn't have done by ourselves. You know, we, like adopting a little girl from Peru that nobody wanted mm -hmm. in the middle of a revolution and a cholera epidemic. That was hard. Wow. And um, I can't see how we could have done that without the two of us standing together. And it was very dangerous in, in Lima at that point in Peru. And uh, there we were, the two of us, <laughs> walking around the streets with those guns everywhere and with this little baby on our chest, right? Well, no, neither of us would have been there by ourselves. So the kinds of adventures we've had, it required two. You know, it required um, the ability to turn and say, uh, is this dangerous or am I am I freaking out? Nope, this is dangerous, okay? So this is what we're going to do, right? <laughs> you know, oh, okay, all right, jolly good. Uh, you know, that now we're clear about that. So, yeah, there's nothing more precious mm. in the world than a loving, intimate relationship. And we all know that on some level. Yeah. We just haven't known how to get there. Mm, 
Thank you for being such an advocate and such an activist of the human heart and spirit and long-term love that gets to get stronger and deeper and juicier through the years. Uh, congratulations to you and your husband. What an adventure the two of you have shared. Yes, and you know. I know we're getting near the end here. And uh, I'm curious for anybody out there who is wondering, like, boundaries are a little bit of a buzzword these days in relationships. If they're wondering, like, does this mean I always, like, every time my partner texts me, do I need to respond? Or like, what, what is you, I've actually wanted to ask you this since um, lots of people are talking about boundaries and I love so much um, your work. I'm like, I wonder what Dr. Sue would say about like, where is the dance between closeness and space and this trend of like, oh, I just need stronger boundaries in order for my relationship to work? Yes, I think it depends what you mean by boundaries. If you mean boundaries that I get to shut you out whenever I feel like it, that doesn't work, okay? Um, but if you look at secure relationships, people don't have any trouble with boundaries. You know, if you look at secure relationships, you know, the little kid reaches out and smacks the mum to get attention, right? The mum holds the kid's hand and says, no, no. Don't hit mummy. No, that hurts. Don't hit mummy, okay? That's not the way to get attention, right? And good relationships are like that. You know, I feel if you have a good relationship, you feel secure enough to say, hey, you know what? I don't like it. When we're at a social gathering and you start telling stories about my childhood i i don't like it i feel uh exposed i don't want you to do that and if it's a good relationship the partner says oh oh okay yeah all right uh sorry sorry got that yeah okay so I love that. The secure, the secure relationship really allows there to be space, which is what we oftentimes tell couples is it's not going to be, you know, you letting go of independence. It will actually create even more independence and yes. even more ease in getting to express our needs or what works or what doesn't because our partner will hear it so much more readily and will feel relaxed knowing that we are connected through all of it. Yes. And, you know, in a good relationship, I can say, I need this space right now to do this. And my partner isn't deadly threatened by it. You know, my partner says, oh, okay. Well, you know, that's all right. But we're still going to have our date night, aren't we? And I say, of course. You know, so that's kind of how it goes. And I think, you know, if people want to sort of follow up, I mean, they can read really Hold Me Tight. It's still yes. selling like hotcakes. It and is. Then, it's as popular as ever, it seems. I know. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I know that the publisher told me years ago, oh, well, it might peak a little bit, but then it always goes down. Well, it's not going down, okay? I, I you know, it's just not. So, uh, in fact, it's doing this. And people can go on our Hold Me Tight, www.holdmetightonline program and do it to do a Hold Me Tight program together. There's often Hold Me Tight groups in your community, you know, um, there are resources out there now for how to have the relationship that we all need to take us through life. Mm -hmm. Really, there are. We don't have to mess about anymore with all these experiments and, you know, uh, weird marketing gigs about uh, sexual positions and what was the one that I loved that I read? Wailing monkey climbing tree. <laughs> okay. I thought, no, that's not the answer to anything. It's, it might be interesting, you know, but no, somehow, no, that's not the thing. So, uh, what an incredible message of hope, though, that. If people are out there and they want to have this loving, lasting relationship, there is a science to it. Um, you have cracked the code 
and there are evidence-based theories and practices, and you have an abundance of resources out there. So yeah, we'll be sure to put in the show notes, show notes, the links to all of your all the, the books and your website and anything else you want to point people to for how they can continue to learn from your magnificence. My magnificence, good Ab- Lord. Um, Absolute uh, magnificence. Oh my gosh, Dr. Sue, you your impact on humanity, it's just beyond anything I could wrap my head and heart around. Um, yeah, I just bow I wish to that, you. I wish that was true, sweet. Oh. <laughs> I, have, I have watched, I, you know, I've been at parties i've been out to dinner i've just met people and i'll like grab a piece of paper and i'll be matching or mapping out the pursue withdrawal dynamic and they'll be like you just explain our whole relationship and then i'll be like you have to get this book um so you really like help turn on the light so people can really see and understand themselves and find their way back home to each other's hearts and to into their own selves and how it impacts people's health on every level it's it's very awe inspiring you have a lovely way of putting it. You know, when in, in a good relationship, we come home to ourselves and to our loved one, right? So it's been really fun talking to you. It's been so wonderful. And you have, in just a sentence, I love to ask people, we're on the Thriving Relationship Show, what a thriving relationship is to you. A thriving relationship is where you're both accessible, emotionally responsive and engaged with each other, not all the time, of course, but when it matters, and that creates the safety for you to play together, experiment, grow together, take risks. That's a thriving relationship. A thriving relationship is where both people are safe and supported, and so they help each other explore and learn and grow. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes, yes to that. Perfection. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue, for joining us for everything you are and everything you do. And so many blessings and so much love to you. And thank you all so much for joining us. You're most, most welcome. Nice to be with you. Take care of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Want more support for your relationship or want to become trained as a certified relationship coach to help other couples? We warmly welcome you to head on over to centerthrive.com. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to see you next time on the Thriving Relationship Show.